I'd like to welcome everybody to our fifth midweek Lenten service as we're continuing on the Eyes on Jesus series that we started back on Ash Wednesday. Tonight our theme is the murderous eyes is our theme for this week as we look at the Sadducees, Pharisees, and the religious scribes who were looking to kill Jesus. And so we continue with that. We thank you for joining us online as Emmanuel is still under a little lockdown with, as we try to keep safe from the coronavirus. So thank you for joining us here for worship this evening, and let us begin. And we make our beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's read together God's Word, selected verses from Psalms and the book of Job. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand. You satisfy the desire of every living thing. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. My eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the net. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself. And my eyes shall behold, and not another, my heart faints within me. This is the word of our Lord. Our first scripture reading for this evening comes from the book of Job, the 24th chapter. There are those who rebel against the light, who are not acquainted with its way, and do not stay in its paths. The murderer rise, murder rises before it is light, that he may kill the poor and needy. And in the night he is like a thief. The eye of the adulterer also awaits for the twilight, saying, No eye will see me. And he veils his face. In the dark they dig through houses. By day they shut themselves up. They do not know the light, for deep darkness is morning to all of them. For they are friends with the terrors of deep darkness. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. Our second reading for this evening comes from 1 John, the third chapter. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brothers righteous. Do not be surprised, brother, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not, lo whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. O oh Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. We continue our worship this evening by singing the selected verses from Our Eyes Behold the Savior's Face.
Our third reading for this evening comes from the Gospel of Matthew, the 23rd chapter. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the monuments of the righteous, saying, If we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. Thus, you witness against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up, then, the measure of your fathers, you serpents, you brood of vipers. How are you to escape being sentenced to hell? Therefore, I send you prophets and wise men, and scribes, some of whom you will kill and crucify, and some of you will flog in your synagogues and persecute from town to town, so that on you may come all the righteous blood shed, shed on earth, from the blood of the innocent Abel to the blood of Zechariah and the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. Truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. Our passion reading for this evening comes from the Gospel of Mark, the 14th chapter. This Lent, we are looking at the events of our Lord's passion through the eyes of some of the people who witnessed it. Today, we read the words of the people who unwittingly called for Jesus' death, the sacrifice for all sin. The Passion of Our Lord, according to St. Mark, the 14th chapter. It was now two days before the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the chief priests and the scribes were seeking to how to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. And they led Jesus to the high priest. And all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together. And Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he was sitting with it, there, the guards, and warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death. But they found none, for many bore false witness against him. But their testimony did not agree. And some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Yet, even about this their testimony did not agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, Have you no answer to make? What is it? that these men testify against you. But he remained silent and made no answer. Again the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the blessed? I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garments and said, What further witness do we need? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all, and they all condemned him as deserving death. And some began to spit on him and cover his face and strike him, saying to him, "Prophesy!" And the guards received him with blows. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. We continue our worship by singing our next hymn, "Upon the Cross Extended."
So maybe you've been there before where you've said or you did something and you look at the eyes of the person that you said or did that thing to and you see the way that they're looking at you. You see is what some people call those evil eyes staring back at you. And when you see that look, you know that you've done something wrong. That's why sometimes people say it's like they're staring daggers through you. Nobody likes to be in that position. We don't like when people are giving us that so-called evil eye because we've messed up. And maybe we've even been there where we've given those evil eyes to somebody because somebody's wronged us. And we give them that look that they know that they messed up. You can only imagine the eyes of those chief priests, the scribes, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, as they were trying to plot the death of Jesus. You know, we heard in our Passion reading, and the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. You can only imagine their eyes as they were thinking about this, as they were plotting the death of Jesus. But can you really blame them for wanting to do this to Jesus? I mean, we heard in our gospel reading, that first third reading from Matthew, when Jesus comes to him saying, Woe to the you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you'll build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the monuments of the righteous. So Jesus was calling them hypocrites, and nobody likes to be hypocrites, or nobody likes to be called that, so you can only imagine their anger as it was boiling over as Jesus said this to him. But it wasn't like Jesus was trying to do this in an unloving manner because it was out of love that he spoke these words to them. They needed to hear the truth that Jesus was speaking to them. You know, it's just as a parent who disciplines a child out of love. You know, they have to hear what they're doing wrong. It reminds me of this time when I was visiting somebody from my first congregation. And I was visiting with this person at their house and like, you know what, Pastor? I didn't like your sermon last weekend. I was like, wow, way to be pretty blunt about that. But knowing that person didn't surprise me. And I felt bad that this person didn't enjoy my sermon. And I was like, well, why didn't you like it? Like, and the person responded by saying, it was showing me what I was doing wrong in my life. So there it was pointing out that flaw or something they needed to change. Just as any message preached is trying to help people say, hey, what, you know what? We need a Savior. I'm not doing this just so I can heave more laws upon you, but it's out of love. Just as it's out of love when a parent disciplines a child. The law is meant to help us see what we're doing wrong. And that's not what the scribes wanted to hear. The Pharisees, Sadducees, none of them wanted to hear that because in their eyes, they were perfect. They did everything they needed to do. And they even went above and beyond the laws and religious requirements of them. So you can only imagine their anger when Jesus calls them out when he calls them hypocrites. And Jesus wanted them to see their hypocrisy and repent of it. He mocks them when he says, fill up then the measure of your fathers. Bring them face to face with the murder that they lay in, their hearts under their pious pretenses of honoring the murdered prophets. And behold, their pious platitudes of, you know, we wouldn't have done this what our fathers did. So even though Jesus was telling them that they are like their fathers, that their fathers murdered the prophets, they were pious saying, we would never do such a thing. We wouldn't be that way. This guilt of the sons lack repentance saying, that's not us. There's no reason that we need to repent of anything. But we can't fool Jesus. Even in our own lives, Jesus knows our intentions. He knows 
what we think. Jesus was telling these religious leaders of the time, you know what? I know your hearts. I see the murder in your hearts. Why don't you go ahead and kill me and continue your family tradition? But this murder, this family tradition is nothing new. We go four chapters into the Bible, Genesis 4, we see the first murder committed in the world. Cain's downcast eyes became murderous when he saw how the Lord favored his brother Abel, and he wanted his vengeance on that. He didn't look at his own sinfulness saying, you know what, maybe I'm not giving my best to God like my brother Abel, but instead his downcast eyes turned to murder. Murder has always been an agency of man, but it comes from the devil. In addressing the Jews who wanted to kill him, Jesus identifies Satan as the father of all who hates God's son, Jesus. And so where do we fit in in all this? It's not like any of us were walking around in that day and age plotting to murder Jesus. And we might be able to say, well, you know, Jesus is just talking about those religious leaders, and it doesn't really apply to us. That's a distance time. You know, we're pretty good people, right? He can't be talking about us. We're solid Christian believers. But John reminds us in First John, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. And later he goes on to say in that chapter, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. So in other words, Jesus is, or John is saying, if you claim to love God, hating, while hating your brother, we are both murderers and a liar, and we cannot love God if we hate our brother. And if you don't love God, then you must hate God. So it looks like Cain, the hostile Jews, and you and I are in the same boat. Because if we really were honest with ourselves, there's probably been times where we talked negatively about somebody. We're like, you know what? I just hate that person. There's nothing to like about that person. I just want to see something happen to them, not in a good way. And we even try to justify ourselves so saying, you know what? It's okay because, you know, this is what they do. This is how they've treated me. This is how they've treated other people. So it's okay for me to feel this way towards them. This makes us a murderer, placed under God's wrath. The Jews filled up the measure of their fathers, and we too should see that in our own lives, that we aren't much different than the religious leaders of that time. And so that's where we look to Christ. Because who would have thought God would have sent His own Son, would allow His Son to be murdered by these sinful men, these horrible, and to save horrible people? Here we have a God who loves us and says, you know what, I'm going to let my Son die just to save these people who rebel against me. That's because God shows us His love for us. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore, we have now been justified by His blood, much more shall we be saved by Him, the wrath of God. I love how Paul writes there in Romans that he, while we were still sinners, God sent His Son doesn't say that God waited for us to be perfect, but it's when we were still sinners. That wrath of God 
is what we deserve. That murderous glance that of for all those times we've had those murderous glances where we have looked upon others with hostility and hatred. We deserve that look of wrath from God, that righteous judgment upon our guilt and our sin. That's what we deserve. But instead of getting what we deserve, Jesus willingly took that wrath for us. He bore God's wrath on our behalf. And there on the cross, Jesus cries out and prays, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus praying for forgiveness for those that literally nailed him to the cross there. But also, I think, for you and me, even though we weren't the ones who nailed him to that cross, literally, but our sins helped put those nails into his hands and his feet. So we played a role in his death on the cross. It's because of that original sin that produces a sin that we see in our lives. So much sin that we can't see that we are sinful without Scripture. Scripture reminds us, here's where you've fallen short. Here's your sins. And that's why our murderous eyes nail Jesus to the cross. And once we realize that, once we realize, wow, I am a sinner, I've done horrible things, we are then ready to receive that joyous good news of forgiveness because of the voluntary sacrifice of Christ. Again, in Romans, Paul writes, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more now then we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life, more than that we are also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. We rejoice in Christ, who turned our murderous eyes away from sin, guilt, and despair. He lifted them up to look upon himself as our Savior so we can rejoice in knowing that we have been saved through that voluntary sacrifice of our Lord and Savior. And it's in his name. Amen. Normally at this time we would continue our worship by gathering our offerings, but as everybody's watching online, we are going to encourage you if you want to give or feel moved to give to please go on our website and there you'll see a place to give either a one-time offering or a recurring offering. Or if you have our app, God With Us, there on there as well you can donate or give your offering through that means. Because even though Emmanuel's on a lockdown right now, we're still doing ministry of reaching out to those in our community who are in need and that they need maybe some sort of help, and we continue on our mission and ministry here at Emmanuel, even though we're not in our building, but the church is everywhere, out in the community. So if you feel moved to give, please take an opportunity now to either go on our website or the app if you have that, and give your offering to the church, or you can even text Emmanuel Give to the number 77. 977, and there it will bring you up to a link to give to Emmanuel. And it's just one of those times as we continue on our ministry, just a little bit different way to do that. And if you do know anybody in need during this difficult time with everything going on with the coronavirus, we still do have Good Samaritan Ministries that if you know somebody that maybe needs some food or clothing or some sort of help, that you can reach out to Good Sam and by appointment, and we can, they can work with you to try to help or help that person that you know who is in need at this time. So p- please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Past, the pastoral staff, Pastor Warren and myself, are still available if you need visits or if you need communion brought to you at your home. Just call the church office, and on there it will direct you to leave a voicemail, which will go to Pastor or myself, and we'll set up a time that we can 
come and visit you, or maybe if needed, we do have our care visitation team that are members of our congregation that just like to go out and show care and love for our members, and they too would take time to come and visit you if you so need during this time. So please don't hesitate to reach out to us here at Emmanuel. We want to still continue to show you love and care just as our Heavenly Father shows us that love and care. So at this time, we continue with our prayer. So let us pray for the church around the world, ourselves and all people in their various needs. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due season. For farmers and ranchers and those who bring food to market, that God would provide favorable weather, bountiful harvests, and relief from both drought and flood. Let us pray to the Lord. Look on them all in your mercy, Heavenly Father. My eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the net for all who struggle with unemployment or underemployment, with poor living conditions or displacement from home, with personal demons or ill health, let us pray to the Lord. Behold their turmoil, Lord Jesus, and grant them relief and hope. His lightnings light up the world. The earth sees and trembles. For all people in authority over communities and countries, all whose decisions affect the climate of the planet and the health of its inhabitants, and all who are charged to maintain justice within their borders and peace among nations, let us pray to the Lord. Gaze upon your servants, O Lord. Protect and guide them that they may serve with wisdom, compassion, and courage. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord. For all who serve the Lord as they care for others, medical personnel and first responders, counselors and advisors, friends and neighbors, professionals and volunteers, let us pray to the Lord. Observe how they use the gifts you have given them, O Holy Spirit, and open the doors of opportunity for them so that they may rejoice together. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. For the church around the world, as clergy and lay leaders seek to proclaim the gospel and faithfully endeavor to share their faith, especially in the face of persecution, let us pray to the Lord. See their struggle, O Holy Spirit, and give them strength to persevere and grow. O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. For the church, wherever it is gathered around word and sacrament, relying on God's steadfast love and faithfulness, and looking forward to the fulfillment of all his gracious promises, let us pray to the Lord. Watch over your church, Lord Jesus. Protect and defend us until that day we see you face to face. Let us pray. O God, from whom come all holy desires, all good counsel, and all just works, give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness. Into your hands, Heavenly Father, we commend ourselves and all from whom we pray, trusting in your mercy for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. 
the blessing of Almighty God, the Father who saw mankind's hopeless condition, the Son who showed into the depth of God's love, and the Holy Spirit who has opened our eyes of faith in Christ, be upon you now and forever. Amen. We continue with our closing song, O for a thousand tongues to sing, 